vindicated uh, in my remarks with some people who suggested that I'd perhaps jumped the gun a little bit early in my condemnation of the actions of the Speaker of the House of Commons. But he's proven today um, through the fact that he was not just willing to break the rules, but he's now broken his words that he's, he's not fit to, to stay in that role and to provide that democratic overview, an important position uh, for all of us. Lee Anderson says apologising for comments made about Sadiq Khan would be a sign of weakness. London's mayors accused him of fuelling anti-Muslim hatred after the Tory MP said he was controlled by Islamists. And Hungary's parliament has voted to approve Sweden's bid to join NATO, ending months of delays. Unanimous support among all members is required to admit new countries to the alliance. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed down 21 points at 76.84. The pound buys a dollar 26 and a euro 16. LBC weather with Ripple Energy climate action you can be proud of. A dry and cold night for most, windy in much of Scotland and Northern Ireland with some showers, a low of minus two. Rain spreading southeastwards in the morning, a brighter afternoon, a high of nine. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Charlotte Morgan. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation cross-question with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. It's two minutes past eight. Are you watching us on Global Player? If not, why not? Because I have four of the most beautiful people in the world of politics with me tonight. Starting off with the delectable Anna Firth. She is Conservative MP for South End West. She's sitting to my right. The very incredibly handsome Ali Milani, National Chair of the Labour Muslim Network and a former councillor and parliamentary candidate. The absolutely beautiful Dame Siobhan McDonough, Labour MP for Mitcham and Morden, who's Chair of the Women's Parliamentary Labour Party and Quentin Lex, the political <laughs> sketch writer for the Daily Mail. <laughs> it's all about beast, timing, isn't it? <laughs> That'll get you back for insulting me during the news. Uh, now, we've we got some meaty subjects to get our teeth into this evening. Lots of you complaining that I didn't talk about Lee Anderson in the last hour. Well, guess what the first question's all about? We need lots more questions on all sorts of different subjects. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. You can text your question on 84850 and you can say, Alexa, send a comment to LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Let's go first to Kevin in Basingstoke. Kevin, hi, what would you like to ask? Why won't Rishi Sunak call out Islamophobia? Now, the Prime Minister says Lee Anderson's comments about Sadiq Khan were wrong, but repeatedly refused to answer whether he thought they were Islamophobic or not. Um, Ali, I'm going to come to you first, because I, I know you've been doing lo lots of interviews on this all day. Um, do, you, do you genuinely believe that Lee Anderson's comments about Sadiq Khan were Islamophobic or just part of the political repartee? No, I do think it was Islamophobic. And I think, actually, Lee Anderson represents, um, not just in his Islamophobic comments, but his entire political career in Westminster, as far as I've seen, the very worst of MPs, and represents what I think is a clown car of, of, of bottom-barrel politicians who do this bravado of saying what everyone is thinking, or oh, and I hear it down the pub, which I think is offensive to the British people. Um, and his comments around Muslims and Islamists and Sadiq Khan were just atrocious, offensive, Islamophobic, racist, and most importantly, they make people like me less safe. Because it's because of comments like this, in the context of 335% rise in Islamophobia, that people like me get death threats, we get hate crime, Muslim women get hijabs pulled off their heads in train stations, and we've had people killed on our streets as a result of it. Uh, and I think that the entire Conservative Party, the Prime Minister, needs to really reflect on how Lee Anderson has represented the party. Well, he's uh, chucked him out. What more could he do? Well, first of all, he could use the word Islamophobia. I think that's atrocious. The Prime Minister's been asked today about uh, the comments, and he refuses to use the word Islamophobia under some, I don't know, this, the, they, they haven't even accepted the Islamophobia definition that the APPG has worked on, that most political parties have agreed on, the Muslim community is broadly behind as well. So he could f start by admitting that the Conservative Party has a problem with Islamophobia. And, you know, you could say Ali Milani, as chair of the Labour Muslim Network, is saying it, but it's not just me. Saida Warsi, who is a Conservative Party chair chairwoman, has said it. Sajid Javid said it during the leadership election. I remember watching it in one of the hustings. He was saying, we we've all got a problem, surely we're going to deal with it. And nothing has been done. So this is, this is really, really a stain on the Conservative Party. Party on Rishi Sunak's leadership, and he needs to get a handle on it. 
Anna Firth. Yeah. The, the Anderson valued colleague, are you sad to see him go? Uh, yes, I am sad to see Lee Anderson go, but he, what he said was unacceptable. It was offensive. Uh, and, you know, he gave the Prime Minister and the Chief Whip no choice. He's, which he's admitted himself. Which he's admitted himself in which his own tweet. Which shows how stupid he is, doesn't it? Well, he's, he's, he was offered the opportunity to apologise. He hasn't apologised. And, you know, I hope he will reflect on that um, because you shouldn't make a comment like that without having the evidence to back it up. Uh, but, but having said that, um, you know, Lee, nonetheless, I think, was trying to reflect... A, you know, a sentiment which is shared by a great number of people who are concerned at seeing marches and protests, you know, week after week, month after month, which are are not always peaceful. We know that because there have been 600 arrests, 40 against the Terrorism Act. And I think a line was crossed last week with the projection onto the House of, Com of Commons of that anti-Semitic slogan. And I, that, that should not happen. And it caused... What has been happening has caused the Speaker to make a cataclysmic error and he has said that it, due to threats, due to due, uh, primarily to women, he interfered with the proceedings in the House of Commons and that should never happen. But it, it, it was worse than that, wasn't it? Because he essentially claimed that Sadiq Khan was being controlled by Islamists. As I've said, it was wrong what he said. It was offensive. It was, you know, you should not make comments like that without evidence to back them up. I mean, that, those are not the, the choice. That is not the choice of words I would have used. And that's why he's no longer a member of the parliamentary party. You, you've written a fairly trenchant article for the Daily Telegraph, um, which is headlined, and I appreciate you don't write the headlines, but it's headlined, nobody wants to admit the scale of the Islamist threat to our democracy. Now, assuming you think that's a fair summation of the article, what is the Islamist threat to our democracy? Well, we've had... In the last 14 years, we've had two uh, MPs who've actually been murdered. We've had another one, a Labour MP, Stephen Timms, who was stabbed. And uh, I think that uh, they were not both, uh, not all three by uh, Islamists. Uh, it's the, the Joe Cox. Well, the, the, the only the one was actually Sir David Amos, your predecessor. Well, well, nonetheless, I represent a seat where my predecessor was murdered by somebody who murdered him because of how he voted in the House of Commons, uh, who was an Islamist. And if you if you look. Over the last 10 years or so, we have had uh, you know, a lot now of terrorist attacks. 2017, uh, you know, we've had, them, um, we, we had the uh, stabbing in, uh, on London Bridge. I mean, we had the murder of PC, PC Keith Palmer outside uh, Parliament. We have had an enormous number now of terrorist incidents where <coughs> there has been uh, an Islamist extremist involved. So I but do there have also been far-right incidents, oh, haven't there? Uh, Absolutely. The problem here is peaceful protests being hijacked by extremists. And that, that should not be happening. And what, is, what happened last week uh, is due to, due to threats. And we really need to know from the speaker uh, you, you, who, who are the threats coming from, what are they, and what is going okay. to be done about them. Quentin Letts. Uh, well, I'm a journalist, as are you, Ian, and... I'm I never a spectator to at these events, and uh, I'm, I think we journalists are in the business of trying to get people to say things rather than trying to stop people saying things. And I'm also rather um, in favour of politicians uh, saying what they think. And if Lee Anderson thinks this, uh, which he presumably did, uh, then I'm, as a journalist, interested to hear that. And I think that the, uh, what was it, the phrase there, that the, 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 the offensive to the British people, if the British people are offended, which they may well be, then let them show their offence at the ballot box. So I'm, I, I, I'm a sort of live and let live person on the whole. And um, I would balance what uh, Anderson has said with the sort of chants that we're, we're hearing at some of these marches in London. And uh, a friend of mine uh, has a, a Jewish daughter and Jewish granddaughters, and they live in Salisbury, of all places. And this daughter of my friend is thinking of emigrating mm. to Israel because she feels so threatened by the chants um, that are being heard at these marches. Uh, I, 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 I really doubt 
But Sadiq Khan is a tough guy, the mayor of London. He can look after himself. I don't suppose he was really himself personally offended by this. And there's politics going on on both sides. The Tories... Please let me finish. Just, I, I think there is politics being played. But when, when politicians get involved, they, they're looking for votes. They're trying to play this. Let, let them... Let them carry out the drama, let us judge it, and then if we are disgusted by it, or if we agree with it, then we can reflect our, our feelings at the ballot box. But the fact that he is being accused of Islamophobia, uh, the Prime Minister refuses to use the word, I mean, I think you, you underestimate Sadiq Khan's views on this. He was on the News Agents podcast today uh, talking about it at, at, at great length. Do you not think that um, Islamophobia should be called out? I'm a, I'm a little bit more sceptical about that politicians. Okay, I don't think there's any evidence that Sadiq Khan has given the city to his mates. That's a trope. It's suggesting that the people who are Muslims uh, are corrupt, are trying to uh, buy the city, whatever. I mean, I, I don't know, Quentin, it's about the radicalisation on all sides, isn't it? I mean, there are, you know, um, the security services are saying they are as worried about right-wing radicalisation as they are... Well, I think they said they were more worried re Religious um, uh, radicalisation. You know, I would never say that I am Sadiq's best friend, but I was horrified when that was said because actually I think he has done a great job at trying to hold our city together at really difficult times. And I don't know whether I am watching different demonstrations than other people, but I see on those demonstrations as many... Um, British white people as um, Asian or Muslim people. I see a combination of people of a religious faith and people of a political view. When Steve Reed, the MP for Croydon North, showed me the demonstration outside his house, most of the people I saw on that video were not people of uh, uh, Muslims. They were kind of the hard left people who used to be on his GC, who were men <laughs> Momentum men men members and are now no longer in the Labour Party. So, when did that happen outside his house? Because we, we heard uh, all about the one outside Tobias Elwood's house, but I have to yeah, say that's the first I've heard that, about Steve Reid. Yeah, it was Steve Reid was maybe right. a month, six weeks but, before that. So, I mean, the idea that the people on the demonstrations are all of a religious view and radicalised... It's simply not the case. We have a group of people who, for good or ill, uh, feel very strongly uh, about the whole issue and are distressed about, the num quite rightly, what's going on um, for the Palestinians in Gaza. And combined with that, we have kind of some fairly radical religious and political people. So it's much more complicated than that. And I just think his comments were plainly untrue, that Sadiq has done his best to try and keep this city together. And they're dangerous, right. that's the okay, point. Okay, I'll come back to you, Ali, in a minute. I just want to read out this follow-up text question from Mo in Barrow, who says, As a proud British Muslim, I've always appreciated how well we've done as a country in respecting and valuing each other, irrespective of our differences. Today, Conservative MP Paul Scully talked about changing neighbourhoods and about there being no-go areas in London and Birmingham where Muslim people live. How is this language anything but inflammatory? I've never voted before, and we have a good MP here in Barrow and Furness. I've decided to vote Labour, not because I believe in them or their policies, but mainly because the government is creating divisions in this country and needlessly inflaming tensions between communities the government should lower the rhetoric yeah look I, I think it's dangerous and I could not disagree more about this being politics and Sadiq Khan not being offended I don't know if you've ever gone around London with Sadiq but he has to walk mm. around with serious security and that is because there are constant threats on his life credible threats on his life and this isn't a game when Lee Anderson says these things, when Boris Johnson historically has said these things, when Zach Goldsmith ran that disgusting campaign for London mayor, what that results in is 
people like myself, Muslims who are in the public space, who do politics, we fear for our lives because people have been killed. I was in Finsbury Park the morning after a Ramadan where a man was run over by a van and killed as a result of the Islamophobia in this country. It's not a game. It's not just politicians saying things and, and you know, just let them let them say whatever they think. I mean, obviously, everybody's th free to say what they think, but there are consequences to our words. And the consequences are the safety of four million Muslims in this country and the protesters who are now being smeared as extremists. We talk about 600 people being arrested. Over a million people have attended these protests, largely people who are desperately, desperately emotionally torn by what they're seeing, the videos of children being blown up in, in Gaza. And so I, I, I'm, I'm here tearing my hair out, even the discussion we're having around Islamophobia, because we don't have that discussion about any other form of bigotry. If I was we do. talking about... We have it about anti-Semitism. No, but the denial where the Prime Minister won't even use the word. The Prime Minister won't even use the word that... Yeah, but you, you, you can turn that round on the Labour Party in some ways and say, well, the Labour Party seems very reluctant to talk about anti-Semitism, even, even now I after the Islam Corbyn years. I don't think reluctant uh, to talk about anti-Semitism. Well, it was Islam the first has, he, you know, he got elected. absolutely he done his level best. Um, and, you know, but there was a point... We've seen it hasn't worked. Worked. But, 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 but I think it certainly has. I think that, you Sorry, know... That you, you had a Labour candidate, the leader of Lancashire County hmm. Council, in a meeting with other Labour councillors where he made some disgusting remarks which can only be interpreted as anti-Semitic and not a single one of them challenged him. Now, that, to me, indicates there's a problem. Oh, well, I think there is always a problem and you always have to challenge it. But Keir has done his best to do that. There were periods over the last few years when, as you know, Ian, I, I was ashamed of my own party. Well, you you and stood up right from the start, and, and unlike Keir Starmer. Um, but I, I think... It would be impossible to know how he could try to do better. And I think oh, that Siobhan. in life, in life, very few people are brave enough, in my experience, to stand up in a room and say you are wrong if they feel the majority are yeah. against them. Liz Truss but, might have done that but, in America but, this week, but, mightn't she? Well, Sat next to Steve Bannon. <laughs> but can I just come back to Siobhan's point there? Because she's saying that Keir did 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 his best. <coughs> I would I would say he was very, very slow uh, with with um the with as as he Alley, and he took a whole weekend and not only that there were Labour front benches out campaigning with him even when it was known the dreadful anti-Semitic things he'd said and so, and one of the, the uh, shadow cabinet was sent onto the media on the on the Monday to come up with this ridiculous story that he'd been hoodwinked by an online conspiracy. That is not taking swift action, whereas the Prime Minister's acted with Lee within 24 okay. hours. Right, we're going to move on to a different subject in Hallelujah. just a moment. <laughs> it's 18 minutes past eight. This is LBC.
21 minutes past eight. Quentin Letts, Ali Milani, Anna Firth and Siobhan McDonough. I've missed out your dame there, is that all right? That's all right. <laughs> the consequences for that. Uh, right, we are going to take another question. It's a text question from John in Watch It in Somerset. Why are the government seeking to criminalise homelessness? How are people expected to pay fines of up to £2,500? Is this the cruelest act yet of a cruel government? Now, Conservative MPs in the more centrist One Nation group have warned the government that its criminal justice bill, intended to deal with nuisance rough sleeping, is very similar to the 200-year-old Vagrancy Act and will do nothing to actually tackle homelessness. Those rough sleeping uh, could indeed face fines of up to £2,500. Siobhan, let's come to you first. Um Homelessness is one of the biggest things that I see at my advice surgery. People evicted Section 21, no fault evictions. Uh, in my case, it's mainly families I see, but it's desperate. We are, are building a generation of children and young people who aren't going to school, who are, are know the um, kind of lack of security of not of having a proper home. And we will rue the day quite apart from the terrible circumstances uh, that people are living. We just simply need to build more houses. But in terms of the, the, the question here, um, I mean, I don't know the details of this, but I mean, it's finding someone £2,500 for rough sleeping seems to be a rather stupid thing to do when you know that no one can pay it. Well, filling the courts, which already have huge backlogs, I mean, they're probably never likely to get as far as the county court to get this fine. <laughs> um, let's go to Anna Firth. Yeah, well, I don't think that the government is seeking to bring, uh, to uh, fine people who are homeless two thousand five hundred pounds. As, as you as you say, that that would be uh, ridiculous. Uh, what the government is trying to do uh, is deal with um, re repeated rough sleeping sort of outside businesses, where it's actually going to have a real um, you know impact on a thriving high street, and that that is something that we want to discourage. But but equally, of course, I mean, I had somebody in my constituency uh, surgery today uh, who had been. Uh, made homeless. Luckily, they've got the offer of of another uh, another uh, flat. But but what we what we really want to do with people who are who are on the streets is 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 get them off the streets and get them back on a path to becoming. Well, you know, well why a not do it member. rather than find them? Well, because in some instance, well, as I say, I I don't think that any court would impose any any sort of fine uh, like that unless it was a repeated pattern of deliberately sort of being a nuisance to uh, a, pre a premises that was actually suffering harm from it's that. It's very hard to imagine anybody in a rational mind sleeping on the street or making that as the choice. Often we see people um, sleeping rough who've got drug or alcohol problems. Diff I mean, if you speak to Louise Casey, who mm. was um, Tony well, Blair's homeless to, herself... She forced me to sleep on the street one night to yeah. do, one, to raise do money. one of these... I mean, I always hate I've these things. Well, and yeah. But, I mean, I'd raise quite a lot of money, but... Yeah. I tell you what, I Matthew Paris did it for a, for a week. He yeah, did. He, well, I, I couldn't do it for a week, yeah. and I, it, it, it does make you okay. I only did it for a day, but it made, really brought home to me how awful it must I be. I did it once yeah. in a park in France. Did you really? Yes, because I couldn't find anywhere to sleep that night. It was a pretty uncomfortable bench. Were, were you fined two and a half thousand francs? No, I wasn't. But uh, I did have to get up very early to avoid this, the street sweepers. But I mean, this is a problem in communities from biblical days. If you read the New Testament, you'll find stories of people who were uh, basically tramps or lepers and uh, had no one to look after them. And uh, around the corner from the, the place where I stay in London, there is a, um, a hostel for not quite the homeless, but for people with problems. And a lot of them um, uh, will have fights uh, with the management and then get thrown out or uh, end up spending the night uh, out in the rough. And uh, it's they have a lot of problems, these people. They have mental problems, they have drink problems, drugs problems. And uh, it's um, I think it's, it's a sort of problem that... Uh, politicians are never going to be able, for all the fine words, are never going to be able really to totally conquer. But that's exactly what happened when Louise Casey was a homelessness czar. She tackled the people with the greatest problems first, but... and it really improved, mm. and it took people off the street. But it requires 
constant attention, constant effort. Um, because but Siobhan, this, this, place, this place around the corner from where we live is a super hostel. It's a really, you know, it's, it's a it's a spot on place. But uh, the, the guys, all, all men uh, in this case, they just are incapable of um, of somehow complying to the discipline, complying with the discipline. And, you know, they are, they, they've got so many problems. I just don't know how... Well, you've how got to tackle solve. those first, haven't you? Because <laughs> lots of people won't go inside yeah. because it's they have those issues. It's not a shortage of money. Issues. Just, but just to give I think a bit it of is a shortage no, of money. In, in, this, in this case... I think it's a shortage of money. I think it's a it's shortage of... Uh, um, uh, of of the places where they're prepared to go. I think if you're trying to get off drink or drugs now, the amount of support compassion. you can get is very limited. Is. A lot of people who sleep on our streets are actually ex-forces, yep. you know, yeah. who are having trouble getting back into normal There, there are a lot, but actually when, when you look at the proportion, it's no different from any other mm. part of society, it turns out. Let me just put this into context, context before I come to you, Ali. Um, this is part of the government's criminal justice bill, and the Tory MP Nikki Aiken, she's MP for the City of mm. Westminster in London, is especially unhappy with it. She wrote recently that if the government doesn't change its plans around fining people who are rough sleeping, then she and other One Nation Tories will seek to table an amendment to remove the nuisance rough sleeping provisions entirely from the bill. She writes that imprisoning or fining these individuals does not help get them off our streets. And I, I, I would suspect that the MP for the cities of London and Westminster probably knows what she's talking about more than anybody else on this issue. Ali? Yeah, this is, for me, really the cruelest form of politics. Because I don't know how any politician, and I, I tend to assume that everybody comes into politics to help people, and we just have different ways of going about it. I don't know how anybody walks past someone who's homeless and thinks of them as a nuisance. The, the idea that you're going to find them, not because they're homeless, but because they're a nuisance and they're homeless, and that, you know, you can sleep rough, just don't do it where I can see you, is ludicrous and cruel. I think... Well, let, know, let, I, let me I, give I an example by, as to where... Can I just say, but I, I walk past, I've grown up my whole life in this city. I love this city. I would never live anywhere else in my life. But I walk past homeless people in huge high story housing in London, where I know, according to research, shelter being one of them, that nearly half of these high rises are empty, owned by conglomerates and billionaires from, from abroad. And we've got rough people sleeping at the base of them in, in desperate conditions in the cold. And we've got flat tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of flats in this city that are empty and our response to that isn't compassion isn't to reach out an arm and to say how can we help these people if there is a drug problem how can we help them if my, my mom was made homeless and she was disabled how can we help these people it's to say we're going to find them because i see you it's just who with a heart does that? Who gets into politics to do that? I don't understand this. Who gets into politics to say to homeless well, people, I think get out the way or I'm going to find you? But they can be a nuisance, actually. They can be a nuisance. Uh, my daughter, age 20, was pursued down the street by a bloke. Um, Doesn't have to be homeless for that to uh, happen. Well, I happen to know that he was a homeless guy. Yeah, but is the, is the variable the next that he's day. What? The, variable, the, the, variable, the variable that causes that isn't that he's homeless. He was one of these guys from the hostel I've been telling you about. And he behaved extremely badly. And I had a row with him the next day. And then he, he improved his behaviour a bit. But, um, you know, it's just, it's not realistic to say that they are not a nuisance. No, they can be a nuisance. I think this is about balancing, isn't it? The interests of everybody in a community. And of course we want to help homeless people off the streets. We want to get them uh, back into halfway houses. We want to get them gradually back into training and, and hopefully back into being a functioning, contributing member of society. But equally, we have to balance the interests of the people who are who are trying to make a living uh, running their, their shop or their business. But in the end, I don't know what proportion of homeless people have have mental health issues but I suspect it's quite a mm. high proportion and I mean during Covid when effectively the, the homelessness issue was solved because there were places for people to go it was only those who were really suffering from bad mental health issues that just refused to be helped and there will always be people well, if the political who will refuse is there, to be helped well that's clear isn't it if the political will is there we can do something yeah, well, we cannot proved. just throw our hands up and say we can't do anything that's not a way to do politics when the political will is there and when there's a crisis point it shows us that we can do something <coughs> but what this is is just 
honestly the cruelest form of politics that says out of sight, out of mind, okay. get out of the way of the shops, go sleep in a park if you will, and just don't cause a problem for me, and that's the homelessness situation dealt with. I just cannot understand. Well, keep your calls coming, 0345 6060 You're listening to Cross Question on LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's 8.31. News headlines with Charlotte Morgan. The SNP says it's been stitched up after the Speaker of the House of Commons denied it a new debate on Gaza. It's understood there'll be a motion put forward by the government tomorrow. The Prime Minister has rejected claims the Tory party is Islamophobic after condemning comments by Lee Anderson. The former Deputy Party Chairman had the whip removed after accusing Sadiq Khan of being controlled by Islamists. And Sweden has cleared its last major obstacle, preventing it from becoming a member of NATO. Hungary's parliament has now given their consent. LBC weather, windy in much of Scotland and Northern Ireland with some showers, mostly dry and cold elsewhere, a low of minus two. This is LBC. Eight thirty-four on LBC. Quentin Letts, Ali Milani, Anna Firth, and Siobhan McDonald with us answering your questions. Now, my esteemed colleagues at LBC have come up with yet another way that you can contact us. I mean, as if phone, text, Alexa isn't enough, or tweeting. You can now WhatsApp us as well. Does anyone ever send a letter? No, oh. no, that's a bit old-fashioned. All you have to do is do 0345 6060 973 into what put that into contacts on your phone or WhatsApp and send us a message and that's what Matt in Bournemouth has done I don't know how he's done it because this is a new new invention but anyway here we go as Vladimir Putin's war machine looks to be taking advantage of western indecision in Ukraine once again placing the future of Ukraine as a nation state as we know it in peril is it time for the British government to have a serious conversation about preparing the United Kingdom for war with Russia and reintroducing conscription. 
Quentin? Uh, no, I don't think that's likely to happen. Uh, first of all, because conscription um, ties up the army in all sorts of training problems, and it's, uh, it's not the way of the modern uh, armed forces anyway. Modern warfare is much more about drones, and it's much more to do with uh, cyber warfare and things like that. Well, is it? Surely Ukraine proves the opposite. No, but I, I think Ukraine is a completely extraordinary um, war, and uh, I, I don't think it's likely to be replicated. Um, the um, Mr Putin uh, has basically lost this war, even if he wins a bit more space in Ukraine. Uh, Kissinger when he was still alive, I of course he, he's still alive when he said it, uh, pointed out that uh, uh, it was now less likely that Russia would be able to uh, attack um, uh, into Europe because uh, it has learned its limitations. It has been shown to be uh, not as uh, dangerous an army as it thought it was. And also, I think there is going to be, a, there, there is, ultimately, there is a political limit to what Mr. Putin can do. And um, uh, I just also would say this, that you can win a few a mile, square miles of Ukraine, but you cannot win the hearts of the Ukrainian people. And the longer that this goes on, uh, the less likely it is that Russia has a long-term future in the Ukraine. Ali. So I think one of the major concerns is a little bit around fatigue. As, as, as the war goes on, uh, the worry is as the heat of the initial invasion moves on, that the, the, the political will from Western countries dissipates as well. Where I think the real area of concern is Donald Trump. Uh, I think Europe, for the longest time, has been quite reliant on America within NATO to be a protective arm of Europe and where I don't I don't definitely don't think conscription or any of anything of the sort is the way to go in fact You're some the of the first research, up. well yeah <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't want me fighting <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, I think a lot of the research suggests that it's not a good way to, to raise an army anyway but the, the concern really is as Donald Trump continues I mean, the kindest ways to appease Russia. Um, and if he is to come into power in America, I think we have to look strategically as to whether we can rely on America as a partner in keeping Europe safe um, and whether Europe needs to rally uh, and our allies need to rally to make sure that that, that we keep Europe safe, that, that, that we continue to support Ukraine in a world where America might not be the supportive neighbour arm that it has been uh, over the last 50 years is a real, real concern. Um, and I think that's what Putin is banking on. Uh, I think he's looking over America and thinking there's a general election in November uh, and I might have a puppet in the White House once again. Anna. Well, I don't think inscription is the way to, to do this, and I'm, I'm sure your, um, your, your WhatsApp probably isn't really serious about that because clearly by the time we've gone through any sort of process like that, it would be um, probably um, pretty irrelevant. But I do think that what we have done as a, as a government uh, is lead, you know, lead the charge. We should be very proud of ourselves and the support that we've given Ukraine. We've now, the, you know, totally humanitarian, economic, financial aid is now nearly £10 billion. We've, we've sent tanks, we've sent missiles, we've sent anti-tank weapons, um, helicopters. Um, but I think the most important thing we've, do, we've done is to train the Ukrainian army. Um, that is actually... Which we've been the, doing since 2014. Which we, yes, and we've exactly. And we've trained some 32,000 Ukrainian soldiers now. And that actually is the, the sustainable long-term way to equip Ukraine to defend themselves with with weapons which we have um, provided i think i think we are doing the right thing uh, in maintaining our support and i think we should be proud of uh, of the efforts that we're making siobhan i think rather unusually you might agree with everything that quentin said yes yes i i do uh, i think that what the ukraine uh russian war has shown us is that nato can stand up and can do things uh, and has done it with a resolve that if only we had shown that resolve for years before and hadn't turned away while Putin um, uh, took on uh, other countries when it took more uh, of Ukraine, uh, if we'd kind of accepted our responsibility and not just left it to the Americans, I think we'd be in a much better place and we need to learn those lessons now. And the fear that the idea that Trump may be president and what that would do for support of Ukraine alone is, is just terrifying. Well, I think my feeling about Trump is that he's an enigma and the more he seems to be signalling one position, the more it may be completely false. I just, I, I think he's, he's impossible to read. Except that kind of um, 
introverted isolationism that we saw um, in America before the Second World War. Uh, but we if don't you look at his record in his first term, I mean, I'm not saying his second term would be the same. Yeah. But if you look at his foreign policy record in his first term, it wasn't actually all bad. There were there were some quite there were some achievements there. And as his supporters would say in America, well, he didn't get us involved in any foreign wars, unlike every previous president going back to God knows when. But you want to be in the position that America, as part of NATO, would be standing up for Ukraine and not on the side of Putin, who I think he recently described as um, a great guy or a good man, mm-hmm. or because but, but he clearly Clinton isn't. Would say, well, that's maybe a double bluff. Also, I don't want to try to see if that is actually the case. I think that the, well, but, but the enemy, idea that could be the case is a bit too risky yeah, for me. Enemy, enemies of America may look at Trump and think, my goodness, this, this man is complete loopy. We better not risk anything. Exactly. I think that might be mm. uh, just as likely to happen. Is that more in hope than expectation? Yeah, though? I think oh, so. I think I mean, he, 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 he is uh, unpredictable, I'd say. Well, well, unstable. I think yeah. we can all agree with that. Um, OK, thank you very much, uh, Matt, on WhatsApp. We'll have, we'll have WhatsApp voice notes next, won't we? That'll be the next innovation. Uh, Martin in Doncaster is on the line. Martin, what would you like to ask? Hi, Ian and panel. Yeah, the question is, is should the North be grateful for scraps when it comes to HS2 money? Do you class £4.7 billion as scraps? We never. We've hardly had, ever, ever, ever had any investment up North. Look, you compare... Yeah, but you're, about to, get, you're, you're about to get £4.7 billion because of the scrapping of Phase 2 of HS2. That's been given to local councils outside of the big cities in the Midlands and Northern England, and those councils will decide what the money gets spent on in line with government guidance. I wonder how strong that government guidance is. Um, now, obviously, you, you don't represent a Northern constituency. Well, in fact, neither of you represent Northern constituency but I'm sure you have views on this, Anna. Well, I certainly don't consider £4.7 billion is scraps at all. And, and if I, I got anything anything remotely approaching um, millions of pounds coming to South End on sea for, for rail upgrades, I'd be extremely pleased. So You've got your city status. What more we, do you want? We want, <laughs> we want more. We want, we, we want more investment. We want South, the city of South End to be the, the greatest seaside city in the country. And so um, I, I, so I, I am always... Already. I am always, I'm always arguing um, uh, with the with the with the uh, transport minister for for more money. Yeah, do you understand and I want, why? I want some of this money to come to South End. Do you understand why Martin feels that the North generally just gets scraps? No. Because if you look at the public transport system in much of the North of England, it is pretty ramshackle compared to what you have in Essex and what I have in Kent. Well, that's Come to Herefordshire. That, that, that's <laughs> Come to Herefordshire. It takes about half a day to get to Herefordshire from London. That's, that's a good to thing, me. It? <laughs> Keeps the riffraff out. <laughs> um, Ali. Look, I... I... One of the things that really as a proud Londoner, as a proud as a proud Londoner, I will say I'm, I'm a Manchester United season ticket holder, so my heart is in the north as well. What? Uh, we'll, we'll, what? We'll, we'll talk about that later, and we're not going to get into it. Goodness I've had a really me. traumatic week. Um, <laughs> I think one of the things that really opened my eyes with this, I, I went to Japan recently and got to witness some of their rail infrastructure, mm. and I could not believe at the ease at which you could travel throughout the country compared to the infrastructure that we have in the UK, which you know we, we're very proud of, but when it comes to The rail networks, for example, I've been to Cornwall, it takes three hours to get to Plymouth and then a further three hours just to get to Cornwall because the rail networks are so far behind the rest of the world. We don't have the Wi-Fi on the trains. And I think what Martin is is, is rightly getting at is there is a feeling of angst in the north that when it comes to investment, uh, the south gets uh, the majority of the the political will and the fervency and the North gets overlooked. And we talk about the four billion not being scraps. But the original budget for HS2 was thirty billion pounds that was supposed to connect the North to the rest of the country and allow the economy to be much more vibrant and for us to invest in places like Leeds and Manchester and Liverpool <coughs> and other places. Um, and so, you know, when we look at the the amount of investment that goes around the country, I absolutely understand the frustrations of Northern colleagues, Northern friends who who say that that the connectivity with the rest of the country is just not there. Siobhan. 
I think we'll look back and say how wrong it was to have scrapped HS2. I appreciate it had difficulties, but we're not very good at big infrastructure projects as a country. But it would have brought us so much. And there are so many countries with so many high speed uh, rail networks. You know, at some point, you've got to bite the bullet and just get on with it. Why haven't Labour said, OK, look, you all think there's no difference between the Conservatives and Labour. Here's a difference. We would build the second stage of HS2. Um, I am imagine they are worried, uh, our front bench are worried about the price tag, are worried about going into an election where, which will get very down and dirty, scrapping over small, relatively small amounts of money. But just to me, it seems obvious that if we're going to grow our economy, if we're going to see a better country, then we have to tackle these big projects. OK, Quentin? I think HS2 is a terrible waste of money. From the start, there was a vanity project by Boris Johnson and David Cameron and Andrew Adonis. I think Gordon Brown sort of gave it the green light uh, in order to just scupper Tory finances, because he knew that, that Cameron wouldn't be able to resist having that delicious little thing in his in his reputation. Uh, I think it was a ridiculous waste of money. And um, the trains that I've taken to to uh, Sheffield, um, to Derby, to Hull, to uh, Manchester from um, from London, and also uh, up to Manchester from Hereford. Uh, pretty good services, much better than the services going west. Honestly, it's yeah. good services to get up to Manchester. Yeah. You're joking. You have well, to pay yeah, hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Pay. Yeah, you have to, to pay ridiculous amounts of money, I agree. Hundreds I agree, and hundreds of pounds no, no, to sit, out, to and, sit and outside a, tra- a toilet uh, with well, hundreds of other people and it's always late. That's what Jeremy you, try, you, try going to, you, you try going west, it's much worse. <laughs> well, well I mean, I'm going to York bottom, on Friday though. to speak at their literary festival. Mm-hmm. So, And I'm going, because there's obviously rail strike on exactly the day that I want to go to York on LNER. So I found that there's a second line that goes to York, the Grand Central Railway. So I'm going to sample that and I shall report back on the delights now, or it, otherwise next week, I'm uh, sure. Honestly, it's I as someone, you know, I haven't done a whole lot of international travel, but the Japan trip really opened my eyes because the the level of inter- infrastructure is incomparable to us in the UK. Why can't we have that? You've got a train that runs on time, that's frequent, that's cheap, that has full Wi-Fi, full service, everybody gets a seat. And in the UK, when I go up to, to Old Trafford to watch my team get battered by Fulham, I have to sit outside a toilet with no Wi-Fi. Well, it serves you no right. You should be supporting a London team like West Ham. Well, anyway, on that, you're note, right on that note, no, no, don't even mention <laughs> it. It's 8.48. This is LBC.
is. It's 8.51 on LBC. We were just debating the merits of Saltburn, which any of you that have watched it, you can guess what we were talking about. Uh, Quentin Letts is here, political sketch writer for the Daily Mail. Ali Milani, national chair of the Labour Muslim Network. Anna Firth, Conservative MP for South End West. And Dame Siobhan McDonough, Labour MP for Mitcham and Morden. Just a brief word, Anna, on your private members' bill. How far has it got? Ah, yes, well... This is on, on pet yes, theft. Yes, pet yes, yes. Uh, well, it's, it's up for its uh, reports and third reading on the 16th of April, I think. And we now have about 16 amendments from Christopher Chope. Oh, God. So, um, we've been choped, uh, but uh, I'm going to be sitting down... Does he down not with... own dogs? Well, he does. He has a Rottweiler. Can you believe? Mm. So that's interesting. Um, so many but jokes, he... no, I won't go there. <laughs> uh, I'm going to sit down with, with Christopher. He promises me that he wants to. He only wants to make the bill better. Uh, but he does seem to have a little bit of a thing against cats, so we do need to mobilise the cat lobby. Yeah, sat right next to you, by the way. The cat lobby is sat right next to you. Excellent. Um, I'm currently just missing my cat, so... That's my. That's it's okay. Eight minutes, you can go and visit your I've little, got a little I've got a little camera in the flat to watch her. Have you? When I'm out, just See, I wanted to get okay. one of those to Very watch what brother. my dogs do when we're not there. <laughs> right, let's go to another question. George is in Bournemouth. That's the second call from Bournemouth we've had today. Uh, the government... Oh, it's the caller. It's not a text. Let's go to George. Hello, George. Hello, good evening. Evening. What would you like to ask? Um, thank you for taking my question. My question was, the UK government has proposed a generation ban on smoking much like that in New Zealand, I wondered, do you think, will it improve public health or will it result in a prohibition-esque um, emerging black market? What do you think? I think it will be slow. At the, I, I think fundamentally it's impro, uh, you know, 1920s drinking, had the habit, and then all of a sudden they said, no, you can't drink anymore. This is a gradual restriction. More people will um, be unable to buy cigarettes. At the same time, demand is decreasing because younger people um, won't begin smoking. And I think 80% of smokers okay. start before the age of 24 and everyone hope, uh, wishes they never started. Let's go to Quentin Letts. Is this political correctness gone mad? Uh, well, I don't, think it's, I don't know if it's political correctness. I think it's political uh, dictatorship gone mad. Uh, and bans bomb. Um, they never work. Uh, at the end of Prohibition in America, there was more boozing going on than there was at the start, I'm delighted to say. And this sort of um, uh, ridiculous uh, idea, are you going to push people into other... They'll do something else to annoy their, their, their parents or the politicians. And it's enough to make me want to take up a pipe and perhaps put some very strong <laughs> marijuana in it. Uh, I mean, it just, it's, why can't politicians just leave us alone and stop telling us what to do? But the smoking ban in public places has worked, oh, hasn't I it? I know, but this is about everything. It's about not even being able to do it in your house or in your home or behind the bicycle sheds. And that just, well, you can kids still do just it, go, you just can't buy them. Mm. Yeah, but, the, well, I mean, basically you can't... Do it, can you? I mean, they're going, if you can't buy the things, you have to get sort of you know, your uh, uncle to go and buy them for you. I mean, I don't know. I think people just go and do something else naughty instead. Siobhan? I think, as you said, the banning smoking in uh, public places has been a great success. We've seen a huge reduction in the taking up of smoking. We've seen a huge uh, reduction in people's health problems from smoking. And I think anything that disince you know, disincentivises it is going to be a good thing for people's health. It is odd, isn't it, that today's younger generation of teenagers, they smoke less... They drink less, they have less sex, there are fewer pre teenage pregnancies. And you think, well, are they leading a very boring life? M much more boring than we used to, eh, Anna? Well, I'm not sure about that. I've got I've got you know, young people and they're always going up to London and going out and they seem to be having... I see, <laughs> certainly seem to be subsidising a, um, a, a, a right old time. But, but I actually think this is really, really important policy. I, d I don't agree with, with Quentin on this at all. He'll still be able to go and buy his cigarettes. The, the, the inspired thing about this is the way it's going to be phased in. And I have, uh, you know, coastal, I, I represent a coastal city. We've got an, a nine-year life expectation gap between the wealthiest parts and the and the poorest parts and I went to my local hospital only last week and they said the biggest thing you can do to 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 bring that to get rid of that gap 
is to stop smoking. It's the biggest single health intervention that will actually improve health outcomes. It's about protecting children at the uh, end of the day. And where is that city again? That city is South End on Sea. You missed a trick there. <laughs> Ali Milani. Yeah, I, I agree. And actually, um, I, I think... I've, I've read similar research that smoking cessation is one of the single biggest uh, interventions that you can make on someone's life to improve their, their health outcomes and, and um, prolong their life. Uh, I'm always slightly more favourable towards cultural in interventions, and I think you're right, it's worked the smoking ban as well as a huge information campaign uh, from the NHS on the impacts of smoking has had a significant impact on my generation. Most of my friends don't smoke, have never smoked. Um, I don't know about the drink and the sex, I'll leave that out to, to, to them. But um, what... The one thing I will I will say and is is I think there were similar outcries when we introduced seatbelts for for cars. Mm. People were outraged at the civil liberties. I was. And if why should I have to wear a seatbelt? And what what's the result been? And We've then I had the to crash at fifty miles an hour and realise why you should wear a seatbelt. Absolutely. We've seen the number of people die as a result of car fatalities more than half. And the person who fronted the seatbelt campaign, Jimmy Savile. Thanks for bringing that up, Quentin. <laughs> Do you, have, do you have another caller on there? Let's yeah, I think let's, let, let's move on quickly to uh, Thomas, who's got a text question. You can only have about 30 seconds each on this one. It is quite a difficult subject, though. Um, how do we keep MPs safe? Harriet Harman suggested to Andrew Marr this evening that safety fears could be allayed by returning to COVID-era hybrid voting and speaking. Siobhan? I think it's. Uh, I think you have to call out uh, violent language. I think we have to control social media much more in that people uh, who are being threatened. And, and, you know, you don't want to give another priority to the police because it must be hard enough already. But some MPs need to be, um, need to be helped by the police. I mean, it, it is an extraordinarily difficult problem. I'm chair of the Women's Parliamentary Labour Party and tomorrow we've got the Electoral Commission coming in because we want to talk talk to them about how they're going to keep uh, women MPs and candidates safe during that election, which is just appalling, isn't it? Ali? I think it's leadership. We all always talk, as in moments of heat, we talk about turning the heat down and making sure that, that politicians are more... Are more re responsible in the languages that we all use and I'm not just talking about elected politicians but all of us who contribute to the political narrative I think we have a responsibility to make sure that the political discussion and discourse is done in the right way in the right temperature um, and I really really do think we need to improve the quality of our political debate um, obviously there's lots of other interventions that we can make but I have learnt in my time in politics both in student politics and in, 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 in mainstream West, Westminster politics that often the rest of the country follows our example and when we act the way we do on Wednesdays, I wasn't there, I'm not a member of parliament, I'd be, I would have been embarrassed to be sat in that, that chamber. But when people see that level of discourse, the okay. results are, are, are very 30 clear. seconds, Anna. But we can't keep politicians completely safe. One of the risks when you go into politics to represent people is you know that there's going to be a, an element of risk and, and that's that's something that you, you have to accept because we can never, never, um, as politicians, not engage with our constituents. But there are some things you can do. There are a lot of measures you can do. If we sort of run through them, we diminish them. But they, that, but they are there to keep MPs uh, safe. But we also must call out, you know, what is the threat? Who is it from? And what are we going to okay. do about it? Quentin? Yeah. Much worse, much worse for politicians to self-muzzle. I want to hear my politicians saying what they think uh, about life and what their people, their, their representative, their, their representing people, and I want them to hear... I want to get, get those views out. The IRA was killing people from the 1920s, politicians. And, uh, you know, this is, I'm afraid, nothing new. I admire the politicians greatly. Uh, Sceptical though I am of them for, um, for speaking out and saying what they think is essential to our democracy. OK, final question. For, I know you want to come in, Siobhan, but we yeah. just haven't yeah. got time. Uh, Cara in Hull says, Mary Poppins has had its rating upgraded from a U to a PG today. Which children's film do you still love watching? as an adult. Ali? Uh, I still watch Aladdin all the time and not the remake but the original cartoon. I kind of, as you can imagine, resonated it with it and you started the show by calling me handsome and I think he's very handsome and we have a lot in common here. Anna? We watch The Sound of Music as a family every Christmas. Best film ever made. Love it. Siobhan? Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. 
Quentin. I was going to say Chitty Chitty Bang Bang too. The child catcher used to terrify me, and I love the the count and his wife. Um, but really, but, but going back to Chitty to to um, to, to uh, Mary Poppins, PG that must stand for priggish gits. I mean, <laughs> really, I mean, <laughs> goodness sake. Well, I'm going to throw the railway children into. Oh the yeah, I love that. Yeah. You yeah. cry. Yeah. The original. One. You cry. Yeah. I do. Mm. Yeah, every time. Ne the whole never time. Seen it. You've never seen oh. it. Oh my goodness. Oh, whole, Next oh, time you're thinking oh, of going to Old Trafford, treat yourself and watch that instead. Now, on, <laughs> on tomorrow's <laughs> panel, we have the columnist Yasmin Alabaya Brown, yeah. the former advisor to Boris Johnson, Samuel Kasumi, plus a couple of MPs, the Liberal Democrats Chief Whip, Wendy Chamberlain, and Catherine Fletcher from the Conservatives. Uh, in the next hour, we are going to talk about housing because some of the UK's biggest house builders are being investigated over whether they've been sharing information which could influence house prices. I mean, the very thought of them doing that. I mean, I don't know what people are thinking of. Uh, there's also a lot of stories about the fact that, OK, there may be a few more houses being built at the moment, but what about the quality of them? Um, someone was telling me earlier on about a new house that was built where the stairs collapsed after three years because they were basically made of plywood. I want to hear your stories of new house building and are we building the quality of houses that we need to in this country? 0345 6060 973. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, Sadi Khan's accusing Lee Anderson of adding fuel to the fire of anti-Muslim hatred. The Conservative MP has had, let, had the whip suspended after saying London's mayor was controlled by Islamists. He says the remarks were clumsy but has refused to apologise. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has stopped short of calling them Islamophobic. I've been very clear that what Lee said was wrong, it was unacceptable and that's why we suspended the whip and it's important that everybody but particularly elected politicians are careful with their words and, and do not inflame tensions. The Speaker of the House of Commons has turned down SNP requests for an emergency Commons debate on Gaza. There was outrage last week when Sir Lindsay Hoyle broke convention and let Labour amend an emotion on a ceasefire. It's understood the government will table its own version. Sweden has cleared its last major obstacle, preventing it from becoming a member of NATO. Hungary's parliament has now voted to approve its bid. Rishi Sunak says that it's an historic day for the alliance. A report revealed people in their 20s are more likely to be out of work because of their health than those in their 40s. The Resolution Foundation has also found poor mental health among young people is on the rise. More than a third aged 18 to 24 have reported symptoms of mental illness, including depression. Chief Executive of Mental Health Health First Aid England, Simon Blake, has told LBC they might be more likely to say when something's wrong. Young people have been through a pandemic, that there are significant changes to the ways of working. We've got a tough economic climate, as you just referenced before. And we also know then you've got the impact of global events, um, climate change, international conflict. A younger generation are also more able to discuss and describe how they are feeling, including their distress. Three Just Stop Oil protesters have been found guilty of aggravated trespass at Wimbledon. The two men and one woman threw confetti and puzzle pieces onto a court last summer. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed down 21 points at 76.84. The pound buys a dollar 26 and the euro 16. LBC Weather with Ripple Energy. Part owner Wind Farm and take control of your energy. A dry, clear and cold night for most. Windy for much of Scotland and Northern Ireland with a low of minus two. Rain in the northwest spreading southeastwards tomorrow, followed by brighter skies. More blustery showers in the north, though, with a high of...